preaching this morning to the book of Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. This is written by the Apostle Paul. I'm going to use the text, verse, verse 10, and I'm going to title the message, Knowing Him. It's based upon our theme. It's the first message that I will have preached in 2016, and I want to stress knowing Him. Paul writes in verse 10, in his own personal life, and he is challenging the Philippian church, one of the most joyful churches, a church that was, uh, had a lot, a lot going for them. And in verse 10 he says, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, that I may know Him. Paul didn't always know Jesus. In fact, Paul <clears throat> did not grow up in a Christian home. Paul was religious. He was dedicated. He was zealous. He was intelligent. But simply religious. And he was empty. And the only thing he knew in his life was intimidation and fear. And Paul used his power as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He used his position of authority in the Jewish community to intimidate those who believed in Jesus Christ. One day, Paul was on his way with proper authority to go into Damascus. He had heard that there were many Christians that were there, and he had names. As he was on his way on what was called the Damascus Road, a very famous road, kind of like the main street to Damascus. He was struck down by a light, the Bible says, brighter than the sun. And he was blinded for three days. His first question was, Who art thou, Lord? And the answer came, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What he was talking about was the conviction of God that he knew was in his breast because just, mo just days before that or maybe a day before that he stood and he held the coat of the first martyr of the church whose name was Stephen and the Bible says he, was, he consented unto his death. And he watched that man being stoned to death for his faith. He watched grown men and women run upon him and chew him, bite on him like children do when they want a toy and they are trying to take it from another toddler. But these were grown men and women that were gnashing on him with their teeth in such anger and such hatred, which Paul was partly responsible for stirring up as a religious leader of that day. And as he stood there, Stephen he heard Stephen say before he expired, and he, he, he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Does that sound like a familiar statement? Statement Jesus made on the cross. And I don't believe Paul could sleep that night, and I don't believe Paul could stand the visual of that. And when he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Paul, what you are experiencing, what you're feeling inside you right now is my conviction. And he said, what wilt thou have me to do? What do you want with my life? And he surrendered at that moment 
to whatever God wanted for his life. God told him, I want you to go to a man's house whose name is Ananias. And I want you to talk to him. He's a godly man. And he will tell you what you need to do. Ananias wound up baptizing Paul because he had put his faith in Christ. And then the Holy Spirit directed him into the wilderness. He said after he trusted Christ in the transformation of his life, he did not go and consult with the disciples or the apostles at that time, but he was in the wilderness for two and a half years with Jesus. You say, how is that possible? Because he lives, folks. And he met with Christ, and Christ mentored him for that time in the wilderness. And then, when it was time, he came back, and he was brought into the, the faith with the disciples, and Paul became a giant of the faith. God used him to start more churches. He became the missionary to the Gentiles. And in spite of all that he had accomplished and all that he had done for the Lord, still he says, this is what my life is about. This is the most important priority of my life. I want to know him. That's the only thing that drives me and motivates me. I want to know him. And he says it twice in this text. Go, if you will, to verse number 7. In verses 4 to 6, and we'll not take time to read it this morning, he mentions his, his background. He talks about his accomplishments of the, in the world and in religion. But then he says in verse 7, But what things were gain to me, those I counted loss for Christ. In other words, he is saying... All the things that I used to think were important and all the, those things that meant things to me, my position, my background, my power, my training, all of those things are, were nothing. They're loss. And so what he is saying is, I'm not living anymore for me. I'm not doing anything for me. My goal and my desire is to know Him and to serve Him and please Him with my life. In verse 8, he says, Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency, look at this, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. What he's saying is, I know a lot about Him now and I have spent all these years, and by the way, at the writing of this, it was about 30 years after he got saved on the Damascus Road that he wrote this. So he's about 30 years old in the Lord, and he's saying, I still don't know him enough. I don't know him more than I, as much as I want to know him. I want to know him more. And that's my prayer in 2016. For my life is I want to know him more. And that's my prayer that every one of us in this room, we will get to know him more. Some of you have been saved longer than I have been alive. And praise God for that. It doesn't matter if you just got saved this year or if you've been saved for 60 or 70 or 80 years, there's still more to get to know him about. We can never be close enough to him. And so Paul says in verse number 8, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Now, by the way, he's not complaining. And he's not begrudging. He is proud of it. He is excited about it. He is thankful that he, he, he got out of that vicious circle of living his life for himself and for things that don't matter, for things that are only in this life, for things that are temporal. He says, my life was a mess. 
and what I used to do and what I used to live for was nothing. But he says, everything I'm doing now, I know is counting for Jesus. And he says, I'm excited about it and I'm thrilled about it and I don't begrudge my past. He wasn't living in his past. You know, it's very easy for us to think about what we used to do for God. What we used to be. And when things are not all that they, they could be as a child of God, we, we look back and we think, I wonder if, what would have happened if I, was, I, I didn't get saved and what could I have been and what would I have been? What does that matter? Nothing is what it would be. You would be nothing. Jesus says, for without me, you can do nothing. We are, our identity as believers is in our Savior. Our, our life, who we are, being a child of God, is all about our relationship that we have with Christ. And folks, if you, if you can't grasp the, the, the magnitude of what you, have, you became when you trusted Jesus, you're, you're missing, you are missing one of the greatest truths that you could ever miss in Scripture. The fact that, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, on the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You are given a gift of Jesus. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The day I got saved was the greatest day of my life. I had some great days. One of those great days was July 7, 1979, when I married this beautiful lady here on the front row. This is my wife, Linda, for you that are visiting. And for you that are not visiting, just to remind you, that's my wife, okay? <laughs> but that was a great day. I had several other great days. One of those days was November 29th. Our first daughter was born. The second great day was January 1st, 1982. That was November 9th, no, 29th, 1980. The second great day was July, January 1st, 1982. My son, Bruce, was born, the first, my first daughter, Stephanie. The next great day was August 11th of 1983. That was when my middle daughter was born. The next great day was February 4th, 1982, when my son Brian was born. And the last great day, and some of the other siblings are not quite convinced that it was a great day, but was when my youngest daughter, who they think is a spoiled brat, and was nicknamed by all of them the princess, and she's right there, and married to my son-in-law, uh, on, no, on September 29th, 1992, my, my youngest daughter was born. All of those were great days. But they pale. And there's nothing that even can compare to December 9th, 1973, when I invited the Lord Jesus Christ to come into my heart and save my soul. And I hope today you can go back in your mind. You may not remember the exact day, but you remember about how old you were and you remember the place, or you ought to. Because when God saves you and God comes into your heart, it's nothing that you should forget or you should ever forget. And Paul remembered that day. And he's saying, I, I don't want to live my life anymore with things that are lost. He says, I do count them but dung. That's just filth. And he says, that I may win Christ. I want Jesus to be the most important thing in my life, is what he's saying. 
In verse 9, he says, I want to be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. By the way, that righteousness which is of the law. There are lots of religious faiths. There are lots of religious creeds. And there are lots of, of rules and regulations in every one of those religions. But that is not what is going to make you a child of God. And that is not what is going to get you to heaven. The only thing that is going to take a, child, take a person and change that person and is going to point them in the right direction in relation to their life is coming to a place of humility and a, a place of repentance and putting your faith and trust in the Son of God, the God, the, the, His name is Jesus. And the moment you call on Him, the moment you trust Him, life forever changes. And here's, here's what He does. He imputes to you His righteousness. The Bible says, For He, that's God the Father, made Him, that's Jesus, sin for us. He became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I am only righteous because of Jesus. My righteousness is His. He took my sin and He gave me His righteousness. He took your sin and He gave you His righteousness. So your righteousness is not based upon your work and efforts in trying to follow a set of rules based upon a law. Your righteousness is based upon His fulfillment of every point of that law. And He gives you the ability to go above and beyond the Mosaic law because you are now in the law of love. And you have been given the power of the Holy Spirit to do it that I may know him he speaks of three things in conclusion I'm going to pick it apart first he says that I may know him the word to know there is a word which doesn't mean an intellectual knowledge now I know the Bible says but without the Without faith it is impossible to please him, meaning pleasing God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But really knowing him is more than just knowing that he is God. The devil knows he's God, but the Bible says he trembles. And last I checked, the devil's not repented and has not changed his position in trying to be like God. He hates God. And so just knowing him intellectually does not put you in any really good company. In other words, you're, that doesn't bump you up a notch just simply because you believe in the existence of God. It's when you transcend that knowledge of who he is to receiving him as your Savior and entering into a personal relationship where you can, you can have a closeness with Him, you and Him, and you and Him alone. My wife doesn't enter into that relationship that I have with God. My children don't enter into that relationship that I have with God. Nobody in this room or nobody outside this room has any part of that relationship that I have with my Heavenly Father and I have with the Son of God and I have with the Holy Spirit. None of them have any part of that. Oh, we can, we can praise the Lord and rejoice, but what I have individually with Christ is special. What you have individually with Christ should be special. And if it's not, it could be if you trust Him. So Paul says, that's, that's how I live my life. He spells it out. This is the highest motivation. This is the most important thing. This is what drives me. This is what I do. This is why I do everything. I do everything because I want to know him more. And so therefore, he did not worry about what others thought about him. 
He did not worry about what was going to happen to him. As long as what he was doing drew him closer to Jesus. That's what he wanted. And so he says, first he says, I want to know him intimately. I want to have a relationship very deep. And he says, I also want to know the power of his resurrection. I want him to work in me and to use me and to put his power upon my life in such a way that it is as powerful as that power that the Heavenly Father, that dunamis, that power that God raised him up from the dead. And that power has the power to help us live holy lives. That power is not only the power that gives us power over death and helps us to be resurrected one day in the future, and that's, that's all well and good, but he says, that's not what he's stressing. He's not talking about future. He says, I want, I want that now. I want to be able to have a life, a Christian life, to live my Christian life in such a way that I see God working in me now in today, in the present, and continue day by day to see his hand in my life in ways that I never saw before. But he connects something else in this verse by the way he writes it. He says, I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. And here's the stress in the text. Though they are separate things, they are combined. You will never know the power of His resurrection until you also enter into the fellowship of His sufferings. And here's what he's saying. Because Paul was given foreknowledge, he was given things told what things he would suffer before and we we haven't but he was told about some of the challenges and some of the difficulties but he said I want to know him in suffering whether that is just whether that is sickness whether that is is death martyrdom but that's really not what he's dealing with here because if you go in the next verses he says not, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. He says, I'm not perfect. I'm not there yet. But he says, but I follow after, and as I'm continuing in my pursuit to know him. And he says, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to know him in such a way that when I stand before him that he will be pleased with me. And, and not that he was trying to earn his love, but that he could do anything. I will be, he's saying, I be, I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to go through anything, to be anything, and to do anything he wants me to do because I want to know him in a way that others don't or won't. So when we go through suffering, here's how to look at it. This is why Paul said he rejoiced in tribulation. This is why John, James said, my brethren count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. It helps you to endure. It helps you to keep moving forward. And it drives you to your knees and drives you to a deeper walk with, the, with God, the God that you love and the God that serves you. And so what he's saying, folks, is he's saying, I want to know him. I want to know his power. And I don't care what he does or what he allows in my life. I'm willing to do it so I can know him in, in my life. And I want you, he's saying to the Philippians, I want you to know him. And we, as the church 
of Christ that has continued to, to be fellowshipping and growing and, and learning and, and coming to, to faith and trusting the Lord through his word. We have this, and he is saying to us in the future, thousands, 2,000 years after he wrote this, he's saying, I want everyone to be able to enter into that, re that relationship, that walk. So the next time that something happens that is unpleasant, that you were not expecting, instead of complaining about it, instead of getting mad about it, why don't you turn it on its ugly head and why don't you say, you know what? I'm gonna let God draw me closer to Him than I have, I've ever been before. I'm going to allow God to show His power on my behalf, throw, sh the, to use this to, to help me to be closer to Him and to know Him more that I can let others know Him more through what He's doing in my life. It's quite a, quite a challenge. It sometimes brings a little inhibition and a little fear. But you know, the Bible says this, for consider him which endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. To know him is to enter into the suffering that he was willing to suffer. The Bible says we are conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Let's stand. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.